Hey guys, and uh, welcome back to the channel here. So today I thought I would walk you through how I uh, spec'd out and designed the the boiler system for my not only my heated driveway and my snowmelt system, but also my my radiant heat that does the garage, the basement, and all of the staple up in the house, as well as um, all of my domestic hot water. So for this portion of it, um, this will give me the load and everything on the boiler for the snow melt. And then I can show you possibly in another video how I spec'd out the radiant. But first, if, if you're if you're new to the channel, one of the things you're going to want to do, I'll, I'll put a link in the playlist below. You're going to want to go back to that playlist. And I, I'm trying to keep things in order there. So first, before you get to this stage, you're going to have already wanted to figure out the space that you want to heat or the size of the slab or driveway or walkway or whatever it is that you're heating you get that square footage you're going to want to have your loop layout pretty much done with your spacing whether it's six inches on center nine inches on center uh, five eighths inch packs three quarter inch packs whatever you use you're going to want to have all of that data before you come to this step for this video so what I used, one of the several methods I used, uh, was the free design snow and ice to melt design manual from Oopener. So if you head to their website, uh, they're a great company. I've used some of their products before. I did not use their PEX on this particular job, but um, I have seen their stuff in use before, and it's, it's, uh, it's good stuff. And it is nice of them to put out these manuals for people like myself to be able to use them and, and read. So if you go to their main website here, and uh, I believe if you go under support, you'll get this design and assistance manual section. And in here, you'll see a section for snow and ice melt. And if you click here and it'll download the snow and, and ice melt uh, digital assistance manual. So once you get that manual, that's, that's going to look like this. And this manual is packed full of great information for anybody really the professional the average do-it-yourselfer like me uh, I read through this entire thing and found it extremely helpful and you know now that my system is up and running and working I can say that if you follow through the steps we're going to do here it, it works um, my supply temperatures are pretty much right on for what they've for what we spec'd out here. My surface temperatures are right on for what we spec'd. Um, so their math that they've done here, it, it works. So I will walk you through that and show you how to do that. So feel free to read through um, all of these chapters, but the main one that I'm gonna focus on in this video is chapter six, the design tutorial. So chapter six um, begins basically with they're walking you through step by step several different factors that you're going to want to go and they have different appendices here that you can go and look things up and you're going to want to do that so um, i'll jump right into it here over here in word i basically just made my own version of this so that we can fill it out as we go and then i have the uh the handy calculator here so Following through um, step one, they're going to want you to identify the outside air temperature and wind speed that you want to design for. So, you know, some of you might be further north where it gets colder and you want this to be able to function at cooler temperatures. Uh, some of you might be further south where you're still looking for snow melt, but it rarely gets below zero or whatever. And, you know, so they don't know where you are. So they've that you need to determine that. Um, there is a note here that I would say is is pretty much right on from my experience in Buffalo, New York, is that the majority of snowfall occurs between 5 and 34 degrees. That's pretty true. Um, usually, I don't know if you've ever heard the term that it's too cold to snow. Um, typically when the when the outdoor temperature drops below you know five degrees you're not getting a lot of snowfall um you know most of it is is between five and 34 so i would say they're right on with this um for their example here they designed for five degrees and i believe in mine i designed for zero so let's find these charts and i'll show you what they're talking about so you want to jump down to appendix c uh, which is going to be right here 
and they're going to give you charts that look like this. And in these charts, you're going to have on the left an outdoor temperature and a wind speed. And then at the top here is the surface temperature that you're aiming for on the slab. So, um, you know, you can, you can aim for 42, um, 45, you know, obviously the warmer you go, the better it'll melt, but it's also the more BTUs it's going to take to get there. So I went with the average, um, which is right, seems to be right around 38 degrees. And, and that's held true. If I walk around with the infrared thermometer when my system is on and it's been up to temperature, it's it's between 38, some sections, you know, because I'm six inches on center, some of the, the quote unquote hot spots uh, might be lower 40s. And then there's an area of mine right where all the PEX comes out of the ground, where it runs into the basement, where I have all the tubing together that sometimes can get can see surface temperatures up, you know, closer to 50. But for the most part, most of the driveway, I would say averages between 38 and 45. So um, anyway, for me here in Buffalo, it can get cold, um, but you know, like like Upener said, it usually doesn't snow below five. So I just figured, you know what? I'll just go for not worst case scenario, but I'll design for zero. So I went ahead and I designed for zero degrees Fahrenheit for my system when I designed it. Um, wind speed, I figured since I'm already going for zero, um, you know, going for 10, now I'm really shooting for the extremes. Why don't I stick to the middle and I'll go for a five mile an hour wind? Um, the odds that it's going to be zero and snowing and five miles an hour wind, and I'm going to have the snowmelt system on, I mean, you're, you're getting really down into the, you know, probably single digit percentages of this occurring. So I uh, I shot for middle of the road here. I didn't go for nothing. I didn't go for 10. I went went for five miles an hour right down the middle. And so we will type that in over here. Uh, next step two is your differential temperature. That is also referred to as your delta T. That's the difference between your supply temperature, your supply, your fluid, your glycol going out and what's coming back. And if we go back here to chapter six and go down to step two, they talk about how they use the standard 25 degree Fahrenheit uh, differential, which is also what I figured for mine. So we'll go ahead and use that. We'll go with uh, 25 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. Step three is from the same charts in Appendix C, we need to select the surface temperature that you want the system to achieve. So in all of their examples, uh, that's 38 degrees. I'm going to stick with that. That's also what I used. And step four, we'll go to the next page here. And step four is determining how many BTUs per square foot that you need uh, in order to achieve melting at this design. So at zero degrees Fahrenheit, five mile an hour wind, you know, you go down through here, we go back to Appendix C, you're going to find the vertical column for 38 degrees. Uh, the square foot load will be down. It's the top number here. I'll, uh, I'll go back to the appendix here and show you. Um, Click back over here. And so right here, we designed for an outdoor temperature of zero, as we have right here. We designed for a five mile an hour wind. So we move over to the right until we find the vertical column there for 38. And this bold black number on the top, that is our BTU per square foot load. So for us, that is 108 BTUs per square foot. Okay, so hopefully you guys are with me uh, so far. If if you have questions or if I miss something, just hit me up down in the comments, and I can always uh, I can always try to help you out or address it. So next is step five, uh, the supply fluid temperature. So same thing within that same appendices C, you're going to see that there is supply temperature requirements based on your spacing. So here's where you need to already have your layout done. And you need to know, did you space your pack six inches, nine inches, 12 inches? You know, you, you need to have already come up with that before you come here to do these calculations because it's it's based off of that. So if we go back down to the appendices we were just at again, for me, zero degrees, five miles an hour, 38 degree surface temperature, a six inch spacing is going to require a supply temperature of 102 degrees. 
Um, a nine inch spacing is going to require a supply fluid temperature of 120. Okay, so a majority of my driveway is six inches, um, except for down at the end of the driveway. And I talked about that in the PEX loop layout video. Uh, I'll link that up above if, if you haven't seen that. Um, so I'm going to go with 102 degrees and Again, I can tell you guys from experience, since I'm kind of doing this after the fact, the system is already installed and works. Um, my, my supply temperature is pretty much 102 degrees and it melts great. This is why I was saying earlier where, you know, Upener really, um, they, they have their, uh, they have their stuff together with this, this, this works very well. So we're going to go with 102 degrees Fahrenheit for my supply. And for my tubing on center distance, we went with a six inch on center, even though some of it is nine, where I would say 80% or more of my driveway is six inches. So we're going to stick with that. Okay, so we'll go back up to uh, chapter six here, back where we left off, and we're on step six. Now you need to know the installation area. So this is, again, if you haven't figured out your square footage as far as what you want to heat, you need to go back and do that. You need to have that. So I did all of that before the PEX was even installed and the driveway was poured. It was one of the first things I did and I made a video on it. Um, it's, it's one of the first videos in the playlist about how I designed the loops. So for me, I had uh, pretty much, you know, I used AutoCAD. AutoCAD was telling me like 1604. When I did it by hand with graph paper, I was getting like 1590 something. So I just pretty much averaged off and said, this is a 1600 square foot uh, driveway or slab that I'm heating. Okay. So step seven is to determine the BTU requirements uh, for the boiler okay this is this is where you're going to size your equipment so you know this is what's going to tell you how big or small of a boiler or water heater in my case or whatever you you need to get away get away with to make this work based on these design conditions you've put in okay so they're saying um, what you want to do here is basically take your btu requirement which for us is 108 uh, BTUs per square foot, okay, and we're going to multiply it by the 1600 square foot that we have, okay, and again, if I pull the calculator up here, you know, you get 108, you multiply by your 1600 square foot slab, and we have a boiler requirement for the snow melt of 172,800, so that's 172,800 BTUs for the slab, for the snow melt alone, this doesn't account for the hot water or the radiant, and I'll talk about that. Um, and this is on a design day. So is it going to be using this all the time, you know, when you're running it? No, this is based on it's zero degrees and there's a five mile an hour wind and you're trying to heat the surface to 38 degrees with a supply temperature of 102. This is, this is what you're what you need right here okay so most of the time when it's in the 20s and 30s and it's snowing you're probably going to be much less than this um, which I've seen in, in, in real life scenarios so um, but this is your design BTU requirement okay so you have to size for the worst case in condition otherwise it won't work so we'll move on to step eight determine the type and size of tubing okay for me um, you know, I used the tubing type was, uh, you know, mine was like an ever hot. Again, I didn't use Upener. Um, I, I could have uh, nothing against it for sure. This was just more re readily available. Um, and mine was a PEX B style pipe and it did have the um, uh, oxygen barrier, the O2 barrier on it. And that's important for snow melt or radiant. If it's a closed system, you need to have that oxygen barrier um, unless you're using everything stainless steel, but still it's, it's easy to come by and it's not expensive. I would just get the O2 tubing. So 8B, uh, what size PEX did you use for me? My whole snow mount system is five eighths inch PEX. I talked about this in the loop layout video. You know, you can use bigger, 
uh, three quarter. You know, I've, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody use one inch. I've seen people use three quarter and the bigger you go, you can then kind of widen out the spacing. Um, but the bigger you go, it also gets a lot more difficult to work with. So, I mean, trying to bend three quarter inch pecs on even nine inch centers gets to be extremely difficult without kinking it. So, you know, I went with five ace. I put a ton of it in the slab, as you, as you can see in my other installation videos. Um, I've never, I've heard of people installing snow melts and not putting enough pecs in the slab. I've never heard of anybody putting too much pecs in the slab. So that was kind of my thought on it. Uh, step nine, your total amount of tubing. Okay, so here what you're going to want to do is um, opener specs out the multiplier here based on your spacing. Okay, and this will tell you how much tubing you need. Um, so your total amount of tubing, if, if you do the math here with them, um, you know, you have 1,600 square feet of tubing. Okay, and you're going to multiply that. I went with a six inch on center distance here. So that's a multiplier of um, 2.0. Okay, and this is easy math, but I'll just, uh, for the sake of showing you guys how to do everything, we'll just do it. So we have 1600 times two, that's 3200 feet of tubing that you're going to need. And I think that sounds about right, because I bought, I want to say I bought 500 foot rolls, and I want to say I bought six of them. So I'd have to go back and look, but um, I split each 500 foot roll into two loops, and I had 14. So uh, figure that out. That's how much tubing I used. I, I did have some left over. Again, some of the loops were only 200 feet. Some of them were 240, I think was my longest one. So, you know, but if you do this, this gives you a rough idea of what you need to order for tubing and what you're going to need. So, um, okay. So now step 10A, this is your um, active loop length. So, Here's where they say determine the average active loop length and the number of loops for the manifold. Okay, the average loop length is used to calculate the flow and pressure loss. So here they're gonna they're gonna help you try to size your pumps. Um, there's also a manifold worksheet in Appendix B if you want to reference that. Um, anyway, um, for me here my active loop length was 220 feet because. Again, if you watch the first video, that's what I designed all of my loops to be. Okay, and then they tell you here that if you take the uh, recommended average loop length for 5 8 inch tubing, they recommend 200. Um, I designed for 220. You know, it, it's it's close enough. Um, you take your your footage of tubing that you require, 3,200, and you divide by the number of feet for your active loop length, you will get how many loops you need. Okay, so from, this is showing 14.5 loops. I ended up with 14 loops. Um, again, my whole driveway is not six inches on center. The, the bottom part, the bottom, I don't know, 15 feet, 20 feet maybe is nine inches on center. So that's probably where I got away with that extra half a loop, that 14.5 that this came out to. I saved because I widened out the spacing at the bottom of the, of the slab. So um, next we'll move on to step 11, uh, determine the leader length. So this is the amount of tubing between the, the heated panel and the manifold location. So this for me would be like where it uh, exit, you know, where it actually leaves the slab and runs down and into the six inch pipe and into the utility room and then gets to the manifold. So that's what they're considering a liter length. Now, mine's extremely close because it's, it's really, it's probably only 10 feet or so, but to be safe, I remember when I designed this, I designed it for a 20 foot liter length, not knowing where in the basement in the utility room I was going to mount those manifolds. So I wanted to leave enough uh, fudge factor here in the formula to be able to account for that. So I calculated for a 20 foot 
liter length. And then uh, 11B is your total loop length. So for, for this example, you know, you, you're taking, in my, or in my case, you're taking the 220 foot uh, active loop length and you're adding the liter length to it and you get a total loop length of 240 feet, even though 220 feet of it is really all that's, that's heating. Okay. So next is step 12. Uh, you need to figure out what percentage of glycol you're going to mix to. So for me, I used a 40% mixture, just like they did in this, in this example over here. Uh, I used a 40% ex, uh, mixture of, I used uh, Cryotech 100, which gives you even a little bit more protection um, than, you know, I've, I found it, it gives you a little bit more protection than, uh, than some of the other brands. So I'll put that in here. Oops, Cryotech 100. So I'd have to go back and look at what 40% gave you, but I want to say it was like freeze protection to negative 15, and then it's movable to negative 20 or 30, and burst is negative 50 or something. I have to go back and look, but uh, yeah, it was plenty of protection for me here in, in Buffalo, New York. It doesn't get that cold. So... Um, okay, next we'll move on to step 13. So 13A is your flow per foot of tubing in gallons per minute. So again, here you're going to go back to the charts in Appendix C, and you're going to enter the flow per loop in gallons per minute. So these are listed after the performance charts, it says. So let's go and see if we can... Uh, if we can find them. And with, with regards to the glycol too, I do think they have a, uh, yeah, right here. So here's, you have to account for the glycol when you're figuring out the, um, the flow per foot of active loop length, because it's different based on the glycol. So for me, uh, with a 40%, actually, we're going to want to be on the next page here where we're looking at the load in BTUs per square foot. Okay, so we're going to find this. Um, our load is 108. And with a 40% glycol at 6 inches on center, right there, we are at 0 0.0046. Okay, so we're going to put that in there. And we're going to go back up to 13B. So we're going to go back up to our design pages here. Uh, follow what they are asking us to do. So we got that. Next, what we're going to want to do is we're going to take that flow per foot of tubing that we just found, 0 0.0046, and we're going to multiply that by our active tubing length, okay, which is not the total. We just want the part that's in the slab here. And we're going to multiply that out. And again, we'll come back over here, 0 0.0046 times our tubing length of 220 gives me pretty much one gallon a minute. I believe that said. So, and that's pretty close. I might be pushing, I might be pushing a little bit less than that. Um, so, but, but it's, it's close. We're in the ballpark. This is more just for sizing the pumps anyway. And I ended up oversizing uh, my pump. So it, it, we're good. Uh, system flow, next step, 14. So let's go back up here to step 14. To obtain the flow for the system, multiply the flow per loop by the number of loops of the system. Okay, so now we have our flow per loop here, which is this 1.012. And we're going to multiply that by all 14 loops in the system. Come back down here. Times 14. 14.16. OK, 
Okay, so that is our system flow in gallons per minute. All right, 15A, we're going to go to the charts in Appendix E, and we're going to need to find the 40% glycol because that's what we're using because uh, it is there is a, a different pressure drop for glycol. It is thicker, obviously, and we're going to want to find the pressure loss for that. So let's go down to Appendix E. E here. Okay, so if you look at the top here, this is going to say, uh, this is going to have your size of your PEX, okay, which in our case it's 5 ace. It's going to have your glycol percentage, 40%. You're going to want to find your gallons per minute here in this GPM column, okay, which for us is, is pretty much between... 0.96 and 1.06. We're at 1.0, so um, we, we'll go with 1.06 here. So this column, for us, we are going to be at 100 degrees. That's the the supply temperature that we're going out to, and at a gallons per minute of oh, I think we want to be on the next one down. So we want to be right here. At a GPM of 1.06 at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 40% glycol, 5 8 inch packs, we want to be 0 0.0170. Okay, so we'll put that in there. And we'll go back to the uh, design manual here. Oh, that's chapter 7. Go back to here. Step 15. And one of our final steps here. Okay, so we did that. Enter the chart in gallons per minute column. 0.67. Yep. Read the feed of head drop. So basically what you want to do here is take your head pressure drop per foot, which we came up with here, and you want to multiply that by the length of your uh, loop. So again, we'll come back over here to our calculator, 0 0.0170 times 220. And you're looking at a head loss of 3.74. Okay. And you're done. You're done with the with the design part of you know the, the design manual here. So next is now you can kind of start to think about a number of things. You've, you've got your, by this point for me, the PEX was already installed. It was already in the driveway. I had done all the design uh, way before the project began. I had my layout done. Then we installed it. We poured it. Everything came back to the boiler room and sat under air pressure for a little while. And then it was, oh my gosh, it was almost a year later. I decided to finally start piping it in and hooking it up and started to run these numbers. So um, I had done some of this beforehand anyway, just to, just to play, but really uh, now you can go and start to figure out what you want to use for a heat source. So for me, I was debating, you know, do I need a boiler? Can I use tankless hot water heaters? Uh, I ultimately deciding, decided on going with the Takagi TH3 DV natural gas unit. Then I had a big debate whether it's one or two units. Is one unit going to be enough? Um, you know, if, if you go to the specifications here and, and you pull up the specs, you go to the literature and you pull up the product specification sheet, you'll see here, um, you know, the, the TH3 DVN model has a maximum input rating of 199. Okay, but... That's just the input rating. It'll modulate down to 15,000, but it has an input rating of 199. Now it's 93% efficient. So you need to calculate that efficiency rating into that. So if you take your 199,000 BTU input rating and you multiply it by the 0.93% efficient, really the maximum output that you can get out of this unit is 185,000 BTUs. So it's still more than what we need for the 172.8. And again, this is on a design day. So, but 
I also have radiant heat in the house that I would want this unit to do, and I want this unit to handle my domestic hot water. So what if the domestic hot water tank is calling and the radiance on, and it's a zero degree, five mile an hour snow melt event, and I've got this thing just going to the wall, is one unit really going to do it? And for me, I just decided it would be safer to go with two. Um, I might have been able to get away with one. I had a lot of people tell me, you know, one will be fine, but I like the idea of two. They were only about 900 bucks each, and I figured while I'm piping it and I'm doing it, now's the time. Plum in both of them. Uh, you know, they do talk to each other. They do easy link, but I can isolate them. So if one of them goes down, I can just isolate that unit while I get parts or whatever. And the other one will handle my domestic the other 10 months out of the year, you know, so I've, I've got a built in backup, so to speak. And, and that one unit will probably do fine heating the space and melting the snow too. So it's just the extra unit that, uh, that gives me that extra protection and that extra oomph. So, uh, that's what I decided, you know, you guys, yours might be different, uh, you might decide to go with a, a boiler. Um, you know, the nice thing I liked about these units is they will modulate from 15,000 with one unit all the way basically to 400,000 with both of them going full tilt. And if you go back to some of my videos, I can't remember if it's the Valentine's Day startup one or the President's Day startup one I did last this past February. I'll link to those above. Um, you can see when this thing comes on, there are times it'll be in the upper 200, lower 300,000 BTU range. So, you know, really, I don't know that one unit would have done everything that I wanted to do. I think it would have, it would have gotten there. I mean, it, it would have been, you know, it would have been floored for the first however long, but it, it might have caught up and eventually come below that 200,000 mark. And I've noticed even with my units after the first 30 minutes, it's well below 200,000. So, um, yeah. So we're coming up on the 33 minute mark here. So this one is uh, probably long enough. So I'll stop it here. Um, hopefully you guys found this useful and helpful. Um, if you did, uh, leave me a comment down below. Make sure to like and subscribe. Do all that nice, fun stuff that helps out my channel. And uh, for the next one, um, I will be talking about the system layout. So how I decided to arrange all the piping using the flat plate heat exchanger. We can get into some of the pump sizing on that one if you guys are interested in that. Um, you know, I can go through kind of how I decided to mix my domestic and everything all in one system. I've had some people ask me what brought me to that decision. So... Yeah, I'll, um, as you can see here, I'll, I'll throw up a picture of this and walk you guys through the entire thing in the next one. So if you want to see that, make sure to like, subscribe, hit that little bell so that when I upload it, you get notified of the new upload. And hopefully we will see you there. Thanks for watching.